Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining this week's weekly market review. Uh, my name is Gerald, and once again, I'll bring you through some of the key developments in the market over the past week, as well as what to look out for in the coming week ahead. Uh, once again, for this week, it will just be myself because Sunday is away for the year-end holidays. Uh, but what we really want to be doing through today's session is to do a recap of what has happened to the market, not just in the past week, but also what has happened for the Singapore market over the past year. Okay, uh, before we start, just a quick disclaimer that today's session is for information purposes only, and it should not be taken to be financial advice. Uh, if you find the session helpful, uh, do leave us a review on Google, uh, either by scanning this QR code or by going to the link that is shown. Uh, we also have a monthly Ask Ya session where you'll be able to ask us more detailed questions. And if there's something that you're keen to join, uh, you can consider taking up a Sias membership, which only costs $1 per month or $12 per year. Okay, so what we saw in the past week is that the US as well as Singapore market saw a very strong rebound. Uh, we saw that the S&P 500 has reached the year-to-date high uh, at about 4,719 points. Uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average at an all-time high of now above 37,000. And the Nasdaq saw strong gains of 2.8% as well. Uh, if I were to look at the STI, it was up 0.2% in the past week, uh, not as much as what we saw for the US stock market, but still within the STI, there are quite a number of stocks that did particularly well. Okay, so what is driving this continued rally in the stock market? Okay, so uh, in the previous uh, weekly market review, we mentioned that we are looking out very closely for the last Fed meeting of this year. Uh, and the key thing that came out from the meeting is the expectations of three rate hikes in 2024. Uh, so if you think about it, over the past one and a half years, we have been on this continuous rate hike cycle. And based on what the Fed is now projecting, we are going to see a reversal of that, such that the rates by the end of 2024 will be about 0.75% lower compared to the current level. Okay, So that is effectively the good news that has excited a lot of investors and driving the big bounce in the stock market. Um, the other way we can take a look at that is what are now investors expecting in terms of the interest rate levels. Uh, where we are now after the Fed paired pause on the interest rate hikes, for the third consecutive time is 5.25 to 5.5%. Uh, expectation is that in the January meeting, quite likely that we will continue to stay at that level. But by the time we are in March, we may potentially see one rate cut in March next year with another five rate cuts in 2024, such that by the end of next year, uh, we are actually at the 3.75 to 4% level. So what you see here is that investors are now expecting an even faster pace of rate cuts compared to what the Fed is projecting. Uh, in total, there are six rate cuts here, which is what the market is now pricing in versus the Fed projection, which is for three rate cuts. But regardless, I think the direction has effectively changed from a period where we are looking at consistent rate hikes to a period where we are looking at when are the first rate cuts going to be coming through. Um, so if I were to look at what this has meant for bond yields, uh, we see a very sharp reversal once again in the US 10-year government bond yield. Uh, it is now below 4%. Uh, just about a month ago, it was at about 5%. So within a very short period of time of one month, it has effectively come from above 5% to now below 4%. And that is effectively what is driving a lot of optimism in the stock market, driven by this moderation in bond yields. Okay, so we see that being translated to the Singapore market as well. Uh, I mentioned earlier that while the STI was about flat last week, uh, there were quite a number of stocks that saw very strong performance. 
And interestingly, all of them are property related stocks. So we have got City Developments, a property developer, which was up 7.5% last week, a bundle of uh, REITs within the STI that were up uh, in the range of 5.8% to 7%. And this will include uh, Maple Tree Pan Asia Commercial Trust, Maple Tree Industrial Trust, as well as Capital Land Integrated Commercial Trust. Uh, last but not least, you also have got UL, another property developer that was up by 4.7%. Uh, if I were to look at the worst performers, uh, you have got the banks starting to languish. Uh, so OCBC down by 2.2%, uh, Capital Land Investment down by 2.3%, which is bucking the trend amongst the property counters uh, because of a negative profit signal that it provided last week. Uh, thereafter, we also got Jardin Psych and Courage down by 3%, Venture down by 3%, and Wilma down by 4.7%. Okay. So I think the very clear trend here is that uh, the sectors, particularly the ones relating to property and REITs, have bounced with the expectations of the interest rate cuts. Uh, but then on the other hand, uh, we've got the banks which are starting to underperform the STI. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that capital land investment has bucked the trend. Uh, effectively, it has fallen in the past week even though all the property stocks had done well in general. So the announcement is really that um, there is a revaluation loss for assets in China, Australia, Europe, the UK, and the US, uh, which will cause a significant fall in its profit for this fiscal year compared to the previous year. Uh, some other uh, corporate developments that were interesting, uh, Semcorp Industries continuing on its renewable energy push, uh, being awarded a 170 megawatt peak project to solarize uh, interim vacant land as well as the rooftops of five buildings on Jurong Island. Uh, this is actually the largest project that's been awarded through a tender by a public sector agency in Singapore today. Uh, for those of you who are following the REIT sector closely, uh, Manulife US REIT uh, unit holders also voted overwhelmingly in favor of the recapitalization plan that's been proposed by the manager. Okay, so now that we are actually at the end of this year, I've effectively tried to pull out some of the top performers in the STI this year. And what we see here is that actually, while the STI has fallen this year, there are actually still a number of stocks that did particularly well with gains of more than 10%. Okay, so you got Semcom Industries with a gain of more than 40%, uh, SIA with a gain of 17%, and Yang Zijiang Shipbuilding with a gain of 16%. Uh, so given the interest in the REITs, I thought it would be interesting to see which are some of the REITs uh, that have done well this year too. Uh, so we've got Fraser's Hospitality Trust up by 11%, uh, Maple Tree Industrial Trust up by 9%, and Capital Land Ascenders read up by 8%. Okay, so given that we are now doing a recap and given that there's a lot of interest in the reads uh, with the expectations of the read cards, uh, what I thought I'll actually go through is what has actually helped to boost the sentiment towards these three reads, uh, which has helped them to outperform both the STI as well as the other reads. Uh, so we start with the first one, which is Fraser's Hospitality Trust. Uh, so what you see here is that uh, since the start of the year, it has actually done fairly well. Uh, while we saw a lot of downward pressure for the REITs over the course of this year, uh, it has actually held up. Uh, and then having a further boost to the share price uh, towards the end of this year. So what is really driving this improvement in performance of Fraser's Hospitality Trust? So... If you were to look at Fraser's Hospitality Trust, it is a trust that has got a lot of host hotels as well as hospitality assets. Uh, so it is, at the end of the day, going to be driven by the increase in tourist arrivals. And what we see here in this chart uh, is that if you look at the international tourist arrivals, uh, between January to July of 2023, uh, we are effectively back to 84% of the pre-COVID-19 levels. Okay, just one year ago in 2022, uh, we were still at about 66% of the pre-COVID levels. 
So this uh, increase in tourist arrivals has continued and that's helped to boost uh, the demand for some of Fraser's hospitality trust assets. Okay, so uh, we can take a look at where uh, its properties, uh, it has effectively got a hospitality access in Australia, uh, which is about 37% of its revenue. Uh, Singapore is 29% of its revenue and UK is 17% of its revenue. Okay, so these are the trends that we see in the hospitality markets across some of its key markets. Uh, if you were to look at Singapore, what we see here is the revenue per available room has continued to increase uh, from about 263 uh, to 316 by the time we are at this year. Uh, likewise, we see a similar trend as well in Sydney amongst the upscale and upper mid skill segment, uh, driven by both an increase in the uh, occupancy rate, which has actually helped to push the REFPA up. So that is effectively what we see for the financial performance. Uh, while quite a number of REITs actually saw their distributions falling this year, uh, Fraser's Hospitality Trust is actually one of the REITs that actually still saw an increase in its distribution per stapled security, okay, driven by the increase in net property income compared to the previous year. Um, so I think while we are looking at a potential rate cuts, we should still be mindful when selecting REITs in our portfolio. And one of the key things that I'll continue to keep a lookout for is whether they have a gearing level that is manageable. So what we see here for Fraser's Hospitality Trust is that it has a gearing level of 34%, uh, which is lower than most of the other REITs and that may provide some comfort to uh, REIT holders around its ability to withstand higher borrowing costs that may be incurred, uh, even if interest rates were to stay elevated. Okay, so uh, this is the trend for the distributions for Fraser's Hospitality Trust. Uh, we saw this sharp decline because of COVID, uh, but with the improve in its occupancy rate, uh, effectively, you have seen this improvement in dividend per share uh, over the last two fiscal years. Okay, so that is effectively Fraser's Hospitality Trust, uh, where we see a strong trend towards the improvement in its distributions, uh, driven by the improved operational performance of its hospitality assets. Okay, next we'll look at uh, Maple Tree Industrial Trust, uh, also one of the REITs that has done better this year. Uh, the share price came under pressure in October because of the concerns about interest rates staying higher for longer. But if you look at the trend since uh, early November, it's effectively bounced around about 210 per share to close at 246 per share as of Friday. Okay, so in case you're not familiar with Maple Tree Industrial Trust, uh, it has got different assets, uh, namely in the data center space, uh, it also has got high-tech buildings, uh, business parks, uh, as well as flattered factories, as well as light industrial buildings. Um, if you look at the breakdown by geography, it is quite evenly split between North America, uh, which is about 85% of its AUM, and Singapore, which is 47% of its AUM. Okay, so what is important to note for Maple Tree Industrial Trust is that uh, there's been quite a significant shift in its portfolio over the last 10 years. Uh, if you look back at its portfolio back in 2010, uh, it has effectively got no data center asset. Uh, but if you look at the portfolio now, actually uh, close to half of the portfolio will come through from data center assets. Uh, if you look at the split by geography back in 2010, all the assets will be in Singapore. Uh, but like I shared earlier, at this point in time, it's got significant North America exposure as well. Okay, so um, what we see here is the revenue as well as distributions for Maple Tree Industrial Trust. Uh, what we see here is that if I were to look at the first half of the fiscal year, uh, which is effectively the half year ending September, uh, it was able to raise the gross revenue just marginally by 0.4%. Um, the net property income came down slightly because of the increase in property operating expense. 
uh, and we saw quite a big increase in its borrowing cost. Uh, so with that, we actually saw the distribution per unit uh, actually coming down by 2% compared to the first half of the last fiscal year. Okay, so not as strong compared to Fraser's Hospitality Trust, where we saw the very big bounce in its distributions. Uh, but against the backdrop of a higher borrowing cost, um, this 2% decline in its distributions uh, would effectively be fairly resilient compared to what we see for some other REITs. Uh, if we were to look at the occupancy rate of its portfolio, uh, fairly stable across the portfolio, uh, remaining at about 93.2% at the end of the second quarter of the fiscal year, uh, which is unchanged from the previous quarter. Uh, and once again, if you were to look at the balance sheet of Maple Tree Industrial Trust, uh, the aggregate leverage ratio is at about 38%. Um, so once again, it is below the 40% level and that effectively would mean that the gearing level will be below what we see for most of the other reads. Um, so if you are worried about the potential impact of higher interest rate on the distributions, uh, what Maple Tree Industrial Trust has provided is a sensitivity of how much a potential increase in interest rates can potentially impact its distribution. And what we see here is that based on the estimates of the uh, REIT manager, uh, if the base rates increase by 100 basis points, then the impact on the distributions is expected to be at about 1.5%. Okay, So not a very significant impact to the distributions, uh, even if the interest rates were to raise by another 100 basis points. Okay, uh, this is the valuation chart of Maple Tree Industrial Trust. Uh, now about 1.3 times price of book, which is already above the historical average. Uh, so something to keep a lookout for uh, if you are looking at the valuation because it is higher than what it was, say, over the course of most of this year. Okay, uh, last but not least, we've got Capital Land Ascenders Trust, uh, another read that saw a very big bounce from November onwards. Uh, from about $2.50 per share to now about $3 per share. Okay, so once again, we can look at the segmental breakdown of Capital Land Ascenders REIT. Uh, so what we see here is that business space would effectively uh, make up about 39% of the asset value. Uh, and then you've got life sciences that make up another 8%. Okay, uh, logistics will be about 25% of its um, portfolio. And then apart of, from that, you've got industrial as well as small data center contribution as well. So comparing this to Maple Tree Industrial Trust, uh, Maple Tree Industrial Trust has got more data center exposure, but Capital Land Ascenders Read uh, would have more of the others, such as logistics and business space. Okay, if you look at the breakdown of assets, uh, you also have got uh, Singapore contributing more to Capital Land Ascender Suites portfolio at about 62%. Uh, US is about 15% of its portfolio, uh, followed by Australia and UK Europe, which make up about 10% each. Okay, so uh, this is the occupancy trend that we see across the portfolio. Uh, quite similar to what we see for Maple Tree Industrial Trust in that the occupancy rate has generally been fairly resilient. Uh, across the entire portfolio, it is at about 94.5%, uh, similar to where it was at the end of June and also at the end of September 2022. Okay, if I were to look at the rental reversions, uh, they are still able to enjoy positive rental reversions across its portfolio. Uh, Singapore up by about 4.4%, uh, US seeing very strong reversions, and then Australia uh, just slight positive, uh, which means that as a total portfolio perspective, uh, at about 5.4% uh, positive reversions in the third quarter of 2022, and then accelerating to 18% uh, in the second quarter of 2023. And the trend has continued in the third quarter of 2023 at about 10% across its entire portfolio. 
Uh, once again, if you were to look at the leverage of Capital Land Ascendance Suite, uh, also fairly healthy at about 37%. Okay, so below the 40% mark. Uh, if you look at the amount of debt that it has, uh, which is on a fixed rate, it is now at about 81%. Uh, so effectively, if there are concerns about interest rates raising further, uh, because it has got a significant portion of its debt fixed at a certain interest rate, uh, it will not have the immediate flow through in terms of an increase in the finance cost. Okay, and this is the distributions trend for Capital Land Ascender Suite. Uh, what we see here is that because of the COVID, uh, it fell in 2020. Uh, but then it has effectively recovered in 2021 and 2022. Uh, once again, if you look at the price to book level, now at about 1.3 times, uh, which is also above where it was for most of the last two years. Okay, so I've gone through three weeks that have done well this year. Uh, we are coming to the end of the year, so the economic calendar is becoming a lot quieter. Uh, at Sias, we are still uh, having a corporate connect, and this time it's with first read happening on Tuesday, 19th of December. Uh, we have got the last six month Singapore T bill auction happening on the 20th of December. Uh, and those are the two key things that we'll continue to keep a lookout for this week. Uh, with that, we'll end the weekly market review for this week. And just as a reminder, this will also be our last weekly market review for 2023. Uh, thanks for joining us through the different sessions uh, and hopefully when we come back in 2024, uh, we will be able to do a refresh around what has happened as well as be prepared for the year that is coming up ahead. So with this, I'd like to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and wishing you all the best in your investing journey. Thank you so much.